Hello and welcome back to my Writer's Shed. I am Susan Moore and today we're going to continue with the adventures of Nat and Fizz in Emerald Secret, the second book in my Nat Walker series for kids and everyone who loves adventure. We left off with Nat at boarding school in Boxbury and her cousin Henry had just arrived in from Hong Kong with his mother, the dreadful Aunt Vera, who is wanting to get her hands on orphan Nat's gazillions. And today we get to chapter 35, Atlantis fashion. Henry ate up all Nat's school lunch of boiled ham and cabbage. I can't believe you actually enjoyed that, she said, finishing the duck wrap that our pink had smuggled in for her. Oh, it's better than Mummy's cooking. Since she came back, we've had to eat from her old weekly menu recipes. It was better when she was in the clinic and Dad ordered noodles for us most nights from Shrimp Moon. Do you remember her Hawaiian tropical sardine delight? Ugh. Nat's stomach heaved at the memory. Yes. The door dorm opened, the dorm door opened and Charlotte stomped in, glowering over at her and Henry sitting on the bed. Hello, said Henry too brightly. Charlotte said nothing. She scowled and turned away. She tossed her books onto the bed and started to rummage through the clothes in her bed box. She's not very nice, whispered Henry. Ignore her, said Nat. Charlotte groaned, slammed down the top of her bed box and kicked it back under the bed. Now I'm going to get another detention, she moaned. Why? asked nosy Henry. Nat nudged him in the ribs. Because I've lost my game shirt again. Charlotte kicked her bed box again before stomping towards the door. Take mine, said Nat. Charlotte swung around. I suppose you wouldn't miss it, would you, seeing as you've got 500 of them? The words were spat out. Actually, I only have one of them, but you're welcome to borrow it, it, it if it will save you from detention, said Nat. Charlotte folded her arms across her chest. Why? Nat shrugged. What do you mean, why? Why not? Charlotte narrowed her eyes. Limpet said to make sure you're all right. He doesn't care a fig for the rest of us. You're his special heiress. You get visitors. You get lunch served up here. I've been boarding since I was eight and I've never been allowed a bird in my room. She stomped off towards the door again. Quick as a flash, Nat leapt out of her bed and blocked the doorway. She was bubbling over with anger. How dare you talk to me like that, said Nat. I might be an heiress, but have you thought for one second that I might not want to be? I'd give anything for a normal life with parents in a happy family. I had a guardian who was my family and he's now dead too. And that's why I have a bird, because it was his and now it is under my charge. Limpet is my guardian now because there is no one else to look after me while my aunt and uncle fight my guardian's clan for my custody and my fortune. Nat was shaking from head to toe. Tears pricked her eyes. She blinked them away. Charlotte was staring at her, wide-eyed. Nat stepped out of the way. Sorry, she said, her head bowed. She lost it. It was so uncouth. Charlotte walked past, closing the door behind her. Nat found herself unable to look at Henry in case she cried. The door opened again and Charlotte reappeared. If the offer's still open, please may I borrow your shirt? Nat pulled out her bed box and handed over her shirt. Charlotte took it from her. I'm sorry too. I'm sorry your guardian died and I do like your bird. She sings nice songs. She turned and ran out. Henry whistled. <whistles> it's more dramatic here than at our flat back at Wetley Towers. Hello! Wen was back on Fizz's screen. What are you 
wearing, said Nat, sitting down next to Henry. Wen started to twirl. Her silver and aqua blue cape fanned out as she spun faster and faster. The way she'd stitched the two fabrics together made it seem as if the whole cape was a series of ocean waves rising and falling. She spun off camera and then there was a loud crash. Ah, yeah! Wen's rabbit robot Fu moved her lens across the room to where Wen lay in a heap of cape underneath her 3D printer. So, Inks, are you all right? said Nat. Wen's head popped up. She was grinning. Like my Atlantis look? It's cool. I've been doing the research. You really have to find this Atlantis place. It's some ancient underwater city. No one knows exactly where it is or what it was like or who lived in it. How's that for a creative clean slate? I am so inspired. Wen jumped up, ran across her bedroom, cape flying and grabbed her drawing sheet off her desk. Look! Nat and Henry peered close in at Fizz's screen. Wen had sketched a girl who looked like a cross between a mermaid and a ninja, spiky hair, shell patterns, kung fu trousers and a bikini top. Will Nat have to wear that? said Henry, scratching his head. Wen nodded. Nat held up her hand. Stop, wait, we've got to find Mo Ye, the first sword. Atlantis is the last bit. We've got to get to Cornwall this weekend. I'll set up Nat Nat to do live feed to Foo for the whole trip, said Henry. Nat put her hand on his arm. Hang on, how are you going to be able to come with me? Aunt Vera isn't going to allow that. Henry pouted. I'm coming, aren't I? You'll need me. Nat rubbed her temples. Part of her head was still in black cod, trying to make sense of it all. She felt the sensation again of her mother's arms around her. Could she just wire back into it? Go to the star and stay there forever. Henry was nudging her. He rested his head on her shoulder. Police! That's the end of chapter 35. Now we're going to rejoin the terrible Baroness Ivy Shiversand and her daughter Saskia in chapter 36, Viking Boat. Saskia was standing in the middle of her walk-in wardrobe. It was really an entire room, specially racked out with shelves, rails and drawers for her extensive bespoke wardrobe. She didn't like any clothes or shoes that were mass produced and that meant more than one of a kind. She looked along the rail of casual dresses, trying to find something that would work for their trip to Cornwall. It would involve going on a boat. Hmm. So full length and corseted seemed a little too constricting for life on the high seas. Hmm. Her stomach churned at the thought. She hated sailing, but Mater had impressed upon her the importance of the trip and her role in it. She held up an ankle length tea dress with a flying bat pattern. No, it wouldn't do, too dull. A niggling wave of irritation started to rise inside her. Ever since Natalie, or the girl, as Mater had called her for years, had arrived, Saskia's life wasn't her own. She'd become Mater's accomplice, and it really was most inconvenient. The cool, refined reputation that she'd been honing for years at Boxbury lay in tatters since the girl's guardian most inconveniently died. The sooner the sword was found, the better. Mater had been obsessing about it since before Saskia was born. It was the first bedtime story she could remember her mother telling her, all about the sword that bestowed ultimate power and everlasting youth upon the one that wore the golden crown. Frankly, she was fed up of it all, and now this stupid trip to Cornwall. Saskia sighed, swiped at the dress hanging near her, nearest to her. Stupid, stupid, stupid. I'm going to finish, the, finish their mid-chapter today. I've got Saskia in her wardrobe, and um, we'll find out what's going to happen next tomorrow. 
Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you're staying well and that I'll see you again soon. Bye bye.